You're now watching Lena Blue TV. Marquise, <laughs> how are you? I'm well. Good. Good to have you here. Yes, it's good to be here. Yes. So we're here at um, the Art Cafe at Motivational Edge. We just wrapped up an event. It was beautiful. Uh, tell me what you thought about it. Oh, I thought it was a, a very beautiful thing to, to see in Miami. Something that I would like to see more of. Marquise, is that your real name or is that your band name? That's my real name. Uh -huh. My mom wanted to name me so that if I was signing a job application, nobody would know uh, my race. Right, right. Marquise, so do you know where um, the um, origin of the name is from? Uh, it's from France. France. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. It's a... I don't want to say what it, I don't want to say what it is, but, uh, because I don't like it too much. But it's the name of the wife of the duke, and if my mom probably would have known that. She probably wouldn't have named me Marquise. <laughs> but, uh. So you actually looked it up later. I looked it up later. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You're 27. How old were you when you got into music? Five years old. My grandma used to sing um, uh, Negro spirituals in the house, and she was always singing like "Way in the Water" and stuff like that. And I would be singing the songs with her, pretty much. And I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to listen to uh, the radio. I wasn't allowed to watch cable. So I didn't have much influences, or, or um, I didn't have much influences when it came to music. So the only music I knew at that time when I was a kid was the music that she was singing. So I was singing Negro spirituals when I was a little kid. Right, right. Yeah. And then, yeah, so that was when I guess uh, that's when I found my love for singing those songs while I was cleaning up and stuff like that, like five or six years old. Do you play any instruments? I play the guitar. Guitar. Yeah. I didn't start playing the guitar until I was like 21 though. 21. Yeah. So because. What your, go ahead. What sparked your interest? Um, I started singing at open mics and um, I wanted to do my own music, but I didn't have my own music to sing to. So I had to play an instrument or I had to have music to back up the songs that I was writing because I was writing songs. Uh, so I, I went and bought a guitar with my financial aid money from college and uh, the guitar was broke, it didn't work and uh, one of my friends, I told him about it and uh, she gave me her guitar because she didn't use it um, and uh, so luckily uh, thanks to Nadia uh, she gave me her guitar and I took that and I would take it to school with me and ask people to show me how to play and they would show me stuff. I would take whatever they show me, uh, and I make a. Usually, they would show me like three or four chords, and I would take the three or four chords and use two of them, right. and make a song out of two chords, wow. two chord songs. All my first songs were two chord songs, and uh, I, I wanted, I really wanted to write, so I had to make the music. I had to do it quick, so I didn't have time to learn. So I just took those two chords and I make my songs, right. and that's how I started pretty much. When did you actually know um, that music? is what you would be doing just as, you know, not just a hobby, but as a career? Uh, I had a job as a salesman sell, selling um, uh, car wax at gas stations. And uh, my boss was 23 years old when I met him. I was 18. Um, so this is like two years after, this is two years after that. But when I decided to do it, however, this is what, Part of what I learned during my life is what sparked me to make that decision. Uh, he was 23 years old. He didn't have a citizenship, and he had a business with like I don't know 15 employees, and we all went and sold car wax at gas stations. Car wax, waterable, waterless washing wax. Just walking up to people, shaking their hand, and showing them the product, and selling it to them. And we would make like ten thousand dollars a week what? out of his office with all of his people that work there I, we probably sell like three hundred dollars worth of materials per person a day or something like that I, I didn't want i wasn't selling that much i make like 50 i make like 50 60 dollars even maybe way less 30 dollars you know we was paying percentage only like 33 percent but a day um or a week. huh a day or a week what do you mean the 30 out of 50. the 30 out of 50 in a day for me you know, but he, he, in his office, he was making like, you know, uh, $1,200 a, a day per, when you add up everybody that sold everything they did in the office, right. it all ended up to be that much. And this was, um, you know, something to me that was just amazing that this was possible. So I was thinking, I, they, they, they teach you how to sell the products. They teach you theories. They teach you all this little stuff. 
So I was like, well, if I could sell some gas, some, some wax at gas stations, and you know, and he can make money like that. If I got a, a product, which would be my music, and people like it, and they're willing to spend a dollar on it per person, five dollars on it per person, and I reach 100 people in a day, that's 100 times however many dollars or whatever, you know, however much the product was. So I was like, well, you know, I'm about to go to school to be a, psych, a, to be a counselor. I was going to be a counselor in any school, in the city schools, and, and basically just be a be a voice for, to the kids. And I was like, well, if what I'm doing is basically counseling with music, you know, I like music more. As a counselor, the kids really not going to want to hear what I'm saying because they're going to automatically assume that I didn't go through what they went through because I'm sitting in an office. Yeah. So um, I was like, well, everything added up to I might as well try it. So at the end of the day, I got I got accepted to FIU on a full ride. So I knew that no matter what, if the music didn't work out, I could always go back to school. So for sure, now I knew, you know, I got a plan B. I got uh, my, my, my business ethics that I learned from my taking business courses or whatever. I got my product. So now it was just up to me to just fucking push it. And that's what I did. And I shouldn't have cursed, but it's up to me to just push it. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. So counseling, um, what sparked your interest in counseling? Why counseling? I studied psychology uh -huh. um, and uh, I figured that I've been, I, I was one of the poor kids in the hood. So if you a poor kid in the hood, it's a different experience because the people in the hood are already mad at you because you ain't got money like them. Wait, well, because you're not acting like you got money. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a problem when, when, when you ain't trying to dress and be like them because this is how you gotta be. This is how you're supposed to be. If you ain't doing this, then you know what you're doing. Like who you think you is? You think you better than us? You think you ain't gotta be like us? You know, who, you know that that just usually the type of attitude. You know, and it, so um, uh, I know I've been there, so I could be. I could really. I don't think there's much that anybody could be going through unless it's you know some physical, like some real harmful type of shit, like you know, like some physical harm or something like that. It ain't really much they can tell me. What you gonna tell me, bro? Like what, everything they gonna say, I'm like, okay, I know about it. I've been there. I, I'm been through that type of stuff, you know. The ramen noodles, not having that much food, cause that, that food thing is the strongest, strongest thing out of everything. Nothing else really, all the other stuff that going in the hood, you know, it can be bad, but at the, at the same time, you kind of get over it. But when food is scarce, that changes shit. You know, that, that you just can't, you can't tell shit to a kid that ain't eating, bro. That's eating half, you know, and that know they're not eating how they should be eating. You know, you can't say something, you can't say nothing to them. And for those kids, those are the ones who really need it the most because they're going to need somebody to realize what they're going through and to actually help them instead of just being like, nah, you know, you got you to pick yourself up by that bootstrap because some of them can't pick themselves up by the bootstrap and those are the ones that it only takes certain people. You're going to have to know. You're going to have to have been there to know that's the one that need the real help because most of the time, they can pick themselves up by the bootstrap. But it's very few and far in between where it's like they really need somebody, bro. So that's, yeah, that's what... Yeah. Tell me about a time where um, you uh, wrote a song or you performed a song and um, a child maybe walked up to you or somebody wrote you and said, hey, like you changed my life or I heard your song and uh, this was really inspirational. Uh, uh, that happens seldom because people don't know me as an artist. They don't know my music. They don't listen to my lyrics. Uh, most of the time when people give me a compliment, it's usually like, man, that was really good. I really like your voice. And for me, for now, it's good enough just to make people feel good for the moment. Uh, as long as I can make an impact on them for the moment right now, until I do get the platform that I, I want to have to be able for them to really listen to me, like right now, this interview. This is the only stuff, like this is the only way they really gonna get to see the person behind the mic uh, uh, on the stage. Cause when you see me, you can think a million different things, but you would never know. You would never know what I've been through. You would never know any of this stuff if I didn't do stuff like this. And uh, with the music, people hear my music, they hear me, they hear my voice, that's really good. You know, they, they like how it sounds. But at some point, when when they realize that I got you know true hardcore like core fans like I do have some core fans uh, and the core fans they listen to my lyrics they really resonate with the music they listen to it to make them feel better to keep them motivated to keep them pushing so that's my goal is because when when I had when I was in the hood uh, if it wasn't for some of these people that I listen to if it wasn't for the positive because uh, I would listen to uh, 
Alicia Keys, Al Green, uh, John Legend a little bit, um, but mainly Bob Marley, uh, because I was a pissed off shorty. I was always mad boy, cause I just moved to the, I just moved to the hood. I went from the hood. I wasn't raised in the hood. I was raised in my grandma house. There was no, I didn't get associated to any society. Not American, not hood. Where you from? From Miami. My grandma kept us sheltered though. No radio, no cable. When you go to school, you meet people, you're around them, right? For eight hours, you go back home, no cable, no radio. You ain't going outside. What you, you don't have that much of the outside. You don't get to really grow up with people. I didn't go to no after school programs. I didn't do none of that stuff. I didn't have no best friends and all that stuff like that. I had my brother though. Um, but so, um, once I was 12, I moved to the hood, and now I went from being really sheltered from society, period, and kind of being taught American, the American way. Like, I was taught that I, I was American, and that, you know, like, um, you know, to, to fight for my country, type of stuff like that. Like, real, uh, every, the men in my family fought wars for America. My grandma was a nurse. She was conservative. She was married. She had a house. She, you know, she was a real... She felt like she had the American dream, and they came from a farm, uh, you know, in, in Georgia. So she worked her way up, and, and she tried to instill that type of American dream mentality in me. But then I'm in the fucking hood. You get, well, you can't, man, god damn, man. I got there where I thought I knew shit. I was like, man, I'm finna show y'all, man, it's America, man. Think, yeah, all right, boy. I learned so, I, I mean, I got took so quick into criminal shit and just bad stuff and, and, and trying to, it started with I went for my first my first time ever being treated uh, being uh, experiencing racism. That was that was the beginning and, and that was the beginning of me saying fuck the world. I'm finna. Uh, I was uh, I was going to Cocoa Walk. Uh, I just moved to the Grove. Uh, me and my brother then was like we finna go out to Cocoa Walk and we finna explore because we've been trapped in the house for 12 years. Cocoa Walk is um, over there by. Um, Cocoa Walk is in the Grove. It's a uh, it's like a shopping mall, shopping okay. center. And it's right down the street from where we live. Like, you know, walking maybe like two or three blocks down from where I live on Elizabeth. Um, and we was like five people in one bedroom. So this is my mama uh, and my three brothers and me. Um, and then eventually her boyfriend, which he helped us move to better places and stuff like that. But so um, we, in, we, on, we on Elizabeth uh, and we're we, we gonna go outside and go to, the, go to the little shopping mall or whatever. So we go to the shopping mall and uh, we walking around, and, and let me remind you, like my grandma raised me to be like Jesus, so that 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 was my like I really you couldn't tell me that I wasn't the closest thing to Jesus, like you know I really felt like I was a good, pure human being, and I pretty much kind of was. I I didn't have no harm and no hate in my heart for nobody. I was just being a regular fucking person. So we go in, we go in, we uh, we walk around. Um, we go into one store and the security guard uh, was there with us, you know, but I don't think nothing of it. And my homeboy's like, yo, security following us. I'm like, y'all crazy, nigga. Security ain't following me. Yeah, you crazy. You got like, man, come on. Anyway, let's go. Let's keep, you know, walking around, looking around, whatever. Uh, we wasn't buying anything. We just went up shopping. But the thing is, is that I had myself had never physically been out in a shopping mall, in a shopping center by myself in my life. First time with me and my brothers, I'm happy as hell. I'm thinking it's like a journey to me. I'm like 12, 13. We go, so we uh, the guy we go to the, the shoe store. Now we in the shoe store, and then he follow us to the shoe store. And now I'm like, man, I'm like, what are you doing? Nah, you know it can't be. It's impossible, bro. He got to just be doing his job. Then eventually it gets to the point where I guess he felt like I don't know what was going on. I guess he didn't like the fact that we was ignoring his presence. So he decided to come up closer to us and literally follow us yeah. everywhere we went. And then I got pissed off. And then, you know, and then that was the first time, but that was the first time in my life that I really, I was like, damn, like people treat people like this. You know, like I didn't know that people got treated like that. And then I realized that they were treating me like that because I came from this neighborhood and it's bad blood between that neighborhood and the rich part of the neighborhood. So it was something that existed before I got there However, it had nothing to do with me. Uh, but that don't change the facts of what it did to me mentally. It, it took me from being somebody who saw myself as a citizen to seeing myself as somebody that's hated. So I didn't know people hated me. And now it was official that people hate me. So from then on, I was living with that shit on me. I still to this day have to, 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 to stop 
thinking about people hating me and I have to do little stuff to be like, you know, all right, they, they, did, they didn't do that because, of, because I'm black or they didn't do that because of this, they didn't do that. And even within the black community, I still get, you know, the whole light skin shit. You got it better than us because you light skin it. But, you know, like, it's, it's really fucked up in any way you look at it. However, I'm still being positive about it. Um, and I'm trying to give people the things that I had to keep me positive, which was the music, like what Bob did for me. I try to give that back in the same way that I can with my same passion and oomph to, so they can feel good and, and be positive. And because all my music is positive. Uh, although we talk about real, I talk about real shit in my music, it's all spent to a positive twist, though. Nice. Wow. How do you. I can, I can tell that this uh, kind of bothers you, um, the fact. Uh, that people maybe misjudge you or uh, just prejudge you and it kind of has an effect on you. Why? Hmm. I guess that would probably be because I, 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 have a, I have a care from people around me. Like a genuine, uh, natural... Uh, how do you say just a uh, not a genuine uh, a general just a general care for people around me and if you around me I want I don't I don't want people around me unhappy I don't want people around me you know I don't know I just I literally genuinely care about people so if somebody uh, I guess dislikes me and they hates me that I guess that hurts me because I don't want people to hate people or dislike people especially not for reasons that they don't have like you don't have any reason to hate me or dislike me and there's no reason why you should be doing that. And if you are doing that, then that's a problem. And that's, a, that's not like, and it's not just a problem that like, oh, that's a problem, it's your problem. No, it's a problem, and it's a problem for me. So that's something that I need to do something about, as well as the person who actually is the fucking perpetrator. Because it, the problem, if the problem is affecting me, it ain't just my problem no more. And that's period, plain and simple. Just like I always felt about... Uh, Coconut Grove and uh, Cocoa Walk. I always felt like, like it's, it's so amazing to me that these people literally can live next to the people in squalor and think it's not their problem. It's going to affect you, bro. And, and, and their children was getting beat up and they was, the houses were getting robbed and they people were getting hurt because you living next to people while they in squalor and you think that problem not going to fucking transfer to you. It's literally like a block that separates this one street, a narrow street that separates rich upon rich between you know stupid poor like one bedroom and five you know five people in one bedroom type of shit uh -huh. oh sorry no it's okay um one last question on that subject what do we what do we do about that what do we do about uh other people's thoughts or uh just the simple fact that we have people next to each other that just simply hate each other for what who knows the only thing we can do is work on ourselves individually, try to be a, a positive influence. The only way it would be the same way do it, the same way America got uh, white and black people to get along with each other, uh, through through activities like sports, stuff like that. Um, because then you get the you you have to you have a common goal um, that you have to reach together. So basically. I think one of the main ways or one of the only ways you probably will be able to get people that kind of hate each other or don't like each other to get along will have to be they have to educate themselves about each other, learn about each other and realize how uh, similar they are. And one of the ways to, only, to make that happen is to have people um, working together for a common goal. Hmm. Wow. And then you know some people are stubborn too, but you know that's a... Yeah, you might have to trick them. But uh, yeah, you're right. People are stubborn, man. Uh, I don't think you know. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's people that's not gonna be. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know how you would trick them, but I'm sure if if you are already uh, doing something in that realm, you would like if you were, if you had in mind to try to get two groups together that hate each other to try to get them to to become more um, uh, communal or cordial, um, then then you would you would start figuring out ways to try to trick them into uh, you know, uh, learning about each other without knowing that they learned about each other or without, you know, feeling like, oh, what, I'm, going to, I'm going to listen to Haitian music or I'm going to go, you know, see Haitian art or, you know, or whatever, I'm going to go look at Puerto Rican, whatever, I don't know, you know. Uh, musically, what are you notorious for? That's a good question. Oh, girl, that's not a good question to ask me, though. <laughs> 
Uh, what am I notorious for? Musically, man, my voice. I, I, it's my voice. I have a tone. Um, it's, a, it's a special tone, I guess. Yeah. People, so, people know it. They feel it. I don't know. It's uh, yeah. uh, When did you realize you had that tone or that gift, that voice? Uh, at open mics, at the open mic when I was like 20 something, yeah. when I was 20 something, um, because I had been singing all my life, but I never really thought I had nothing. You know, I just sing because I love singing. Uh, I took chorus, but I chose to took chorus in the hood, just so y'all know this, this is a very brave decision to make because I'm not somebody that's in the hood that's like sheltered. I'm hood in the hood and I'm poor, so that means I'm exposed. That means that when I, like, you, you, Every bully in the hood, I was the one that they would, I'm one of them people that like, I wouldn't hang around unless I was with my clique because I already know I'm a target. So because I'm, because I'm light skinned, because I was smart, because I sing, uh, and I was, I was an artist. I've always been an artist, but people always kind of never ever, could, I was around the poorest of the poor and to have an artist around you most of the time, they like, you know, who nigga, like, you know, what the fuck you doing, bro? Like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't be like that, you know? <laughs> like, so I didn't do it. I didn't sing for years, bro, when I was, like, fucking 14 was, like, the last time I took a chorus class. And then I stopped singing until I was 20, 21. And then I, I sung in the open mic, and I saw how people was acting, man. And I'm like, if they acting like this, and I can sell that, that, that gas, that fucking wax at the gas station, then I can sell this shit. Like, I could literally just go to open mics in the same way I was going to the gas station and just sell, you know, however many much of my product in a day and do the same thing he was doing so I can get 10000 you know, a week if I had a bunch of teammates working doing the same thing. So I'm definitely, bro, I'm still, I'm still about that life. I'm, like, ready to get my shit, man, have my shit packaged up, get me a little team together, man. Y'all push that gas station, man. Let's go. Let's get it. Yeah. So what's your overall plan when you break into the industry? Once I break into the industry, my goal would be to just try my best not to get sucked into that, uh, how do you say, I, try my best not to let it all go to my head, I guess, you know, try to still be myself, stay humble, try to keep my head down and stay, keep my foot on the ground type of shit like that, you know, uh, I think that'll be like my main concern uh, because the, the music and the, the work, my work will speak for itself. It'll make an impact on its own. The main thing I got to worry about is trying, uh, keeping myself sane while it's, while it's happening. What's your ultimate goal? My ultimate goal? In what sense, though? In what terms? For, for what? For my music or for my message or for... Uh, Musically. Musically, my ultimate goal would be to be uh, traveling around the world, filling out stadiums. Filling out stadiums for my music. Not like, you know, I'm coming to the stadium uh, and like, uh, I don't know, um, I'm coming on somebody else's bill. Like, I'm coming on my bill. It's Marquis Fair at the top of the marquee. And they came to see me. And it's millions of them. And they singing the song and they chanting words. They know the words for word, word for word. That, I mean, that's my ultimate goal would be to be able to, to do that. To be able to go anywhere around the world and pretty much stack wherever I'm at down to the brim and then I'm definitely and it's also gonna be a way for me to to bring in the artists that I want people to hear that people need to hear that that, that have a message that's similar to mine that got the same vibe or whatever it is I'll have a platform now that I can just like you know when I because I'm right now the artist that needs somebody to give me a platform and I'm pretty sure someday somehow somebody gonna be like yeah you know come on come to my stage and uh, I'm gonna be doing the same thing right what do you stand for what do I stand for that's a great fucking question. I like that question. That's one of the best questions I had for a long time. What do I stand for? I stand for unity. Integrity. And peace. Those are the things that I, I think are, uh, well, I don't, peace is a little too, too, uh, broad and big but uh yeah unity and integrity i'll say we'll leave the peace out for now because unity and integrity the unity kind of uh got the peace already a part of it you know so being unified uh uh what do i stand for i stand for unification and integrity 
Kind of briefly elaborate on those two. Okay, by, by unification, uh, I don't necessarily mean unification. I, I mean uh, tolerance. Not even tolerance. Uh, I want people to be able to live together and appreciate each other and their cultures without hating on them or without, like, you know, I don't know, like, uh, uh, f I, for the unity part, I just want people to be able to live in peace and harmony around each other. Like, I love Cuban music, man, some of, that, or some of the Spanish music that I hear, bro. I can da dance to that shit and vibe to it, you know, for as long as I can, but I'm gonna have to go back to stuff that I'm, I'm normally used to. But I think everybody should be able to do that, but some people don't want to allow themselves to give love to other cultures and other people because they feel the same way. Well, I know where it's coming from because I was there because they feel like they hate them and they don't want to show love to somebody that hate them. And that's the, it's the same type of mentality that I've been beat into my head since I was 12 that I've been trying to get rid of since I was 21. No matter what it is that you that you selling them. So so even though I could have like I knew my talent was good, I heard people listen to me. But now I know that one out of 10 people that hear me no matter how hard with my music might be might buy the song because they like how I look. Might buy the song because they like how I smell in the place that I was in. Might buy the song because they liked my hustle when I was trying to sell it to them. And that was enough for me to know that even if uh, I'm doing against the grain and nobody likes what I like, two or three of them out of the crowd, out of the ten, gonna like it and they will buy it. But that's a very organic, very uh, build, 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 build type of way. That's not like a, most of the time nowadays people do what everybody else is doing because they want to quickly get to the point that they need to get at to be able to, you know, do their thing or to make money, whatever they want to do. Um, but for me, uh, I, I'd rather build it organically. Uh, I like building it organically. I, I like having my own business. I like being there to wake up in the morning. I used to, I used to play on the streets every day. I still wish I could do that. The reason I can't do that is because in Miami you gotta have permits and all this stuff like that. Uh, it's not easy to find a good spot uh, because you don't have enough traffic where they actually allow you to stay and, and play. So. It sucks, but I love having my own business and being able to, you know, work for myself. And that's, that's, that's one of the... But it's not something that you, you, you just don't get. It, it's a business and you build it. It's a, it's a... People think that, like, I don't know, man, you just be good. Like, if you're just talented, you're just supposed to, I don't know, just make a lot of money because you're talented or, I don't know, get, get signed to a label or something like that. But uh, that's cool and everything, but you still, even if you got signed to a label, bro, you still got to put in that work and... I'd much rather come to the label having already put in the work and having leverage and being like, nah, you know what? I want this much amount of money. Um, I need this, I need that, and I need that. And I know why I need that because I already been doing it. Like, you know, I'm gonna come to somebody like, you know what? I got this right here, I'm making this amount of money. I'm trying to double that, but I need this and this and that. So uh, uh, let's work together. Versus I don't have anything but some talent and, and uh, you can just, buy everything and I owe you all the money for the next 10 to 20 years you know like this yeah what motivates you to stay on your hustle Oof, that's a really good question I don't I have to that varies that what motivates me to stay on my hustle man oof I'm on a I, I can't tell you I'm on a mission bro I just always, I've been on a mission since I was a shorty I'm just a I'm, I don't know I can't I couldn't, I could, I, what motivates me to keep going, bro? Ah, uh, maybe it would have to be a bunch of different things. You know, it, it's definitely not one thing. Uh, the, the possibilities um, of, 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 of the lives I could change, you know. Um, uh, being able to have a family, because I want to have a family really bad. Peace out, y'all. Um, so wanting to have a family is a real big motivation for me. Uh, the impact that I can make on the world, leaving a legacy, uh, leaving uh, uh, also uh, showing people, uh, I want people being, I want people to, uh, I'm an African American. Uh, my, my dad is from Jamaica. My grandma is from Macon, Georgia. Her, 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 her mother was uh, Native American. Her dad was African American. Her husband, my grandfather, his mother was Native American, his father was African American. 
I'm as American as it gets. I, I feel like I'm an American uh, because I am. I'm literally Native American and I got African descent. But with that being said, I want people to know what African American is. And because people don't really, all they see about African Americans is, you know, what they see on TV. But I'm not none of that stuff. And um, uh, I was raised in a very, very genuine, very close to the essence of our people type of way. Um, and I, I really feel like the people like my grandmother and people like her who, who and, and my grandfather, who were very sophisticated, you know, like carried them, they, they, they had houses, they had nine kids, nine kids and they raised nine kids. They only could send one to college, but also uh, they only could send one to college and that affects a lot. But, and that's how I got ended up being in my situation. Um, but, um, you know, coming from that, I want people to understand that that exists and that that's a thing. That's like, you know, that we live, we not just all fucking hood. We end up in the hood because of shit, you know? Like, it's not like every African-American is just, you know, I don't know, out here like, I don't know, all, you know what I'm saying, nigga on the corner with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I, I was a little bit when I was a little kid, but it wasn't for me. One last thing before you go. If you could leave the world with words of encouragement, Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing, man, and just do what make you happy, bro. As long as you're happy, you're not harming nobody, do it. Makes you happy, you're not harming anybody else, do it. And everything else should fall into place. <laughs> Hopefully it does. It's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Yes.